Hi everybody, it's just gone seven, so I think we'll get going with our book launch. Um, my name's Jasmine, I'm from Carconet Press, for those of you that don't know me. Um, obviously we're here tonight to launch Claudine Tutungi's new collection, um, Tutung, which is very exciting, I'm really pleased. Um, thank you all for being here so much. Um, so tonight we're going to hear from Claudine, um, we're also going to be joined by Emma Harding, uh, Emma is a writer and a BBC radio producer. She specialises in drama and poetry. Um, so she's going to be chatting uh, with Claudine a little later. So before I hand over, I just want to point some things out to you. Um, you probably noticed that you can't, um, you guys cannot turn your cameras or your microphones on. Um, so please do, I can see that some of you have found the chat already, find the chat function. Um, do make sure that it says all panellists and attendees so you can see each other's messages, um, but please do say hello to us, um, let us know what you think of the reading throughout, I'll be putting um, the code in there for you, I'll put that now um, so you can get your copy of the book, um, that'll come as an email tomorrow as well so don't worry about it um, if, if this is happening too quickly for you. Um, so in a second I'm going to disappear, Emma's going to come up on screen and she's going to say a couple of words and introduce Claudine before Claudine's reading. Um, during the reading, I'm gonna be showing the text on screen. Um, now this is meant to make it easier for you to listen along, but if you don't want to see the text, you can double click on Claudine's face, it'll make it bigger, or you can sort of drag the box um, to make that screen bigger. You're in control of your own screen. Um, if you do have any problems, put it in the chat and I'll see if I can help you from where I am. So I think these are the only things to note. Um, Oh, towards the end of the event, we do want to open things up to you guys. We want you to get involved in the conversation. Um, so as well as the chat, there's also a Q&A function. Um, you might need to click on more or somewhere else on your screen, but there should be a button that says Q&A. Um, please do get some um, questions lined up so that Emma can put them to Claudine later on in the reading um, and we can get you involved in the conversation. So um, I think that's everything that I need to tell you. Um, I can see that some people are sort of raising your hand in the... In, in that function there, please just pop any questions in the chat at this stage because um, I can't turn your microphones on. Um, so yeah, please use the chat for that. So um, without further ado, I think we'll get going. I am going to hand over to Emma, um, who is here. Okay, thank you guys. As if by magic. Thank you, Jasmine. And good evening, and thank you for joining us to celebrate the launch of Claudine Tatunji's Two Tongues, a sparkling sequel to her first collection, Smoothie. Claudine is a poet, a playwright, and a radio dramatist. She's worked as a teacher and as a BBC radio drama producer. She's also a recovering actor. Claudine grew up in Warwickshire uh, with her two siblings, a Cumbrian mother and a Lebanese father. And I very much get the impression of a polyglot household in which conversations might start in one language and end in another. So it's no surprise that Claudine herself is a talented linguist. And I'm going to be talking to her a little bit later about how some of these elements feed into her poetry. In fact, it's impossible to talk about two tongues without slipping into another language, since it's a collection full of joie de vivre, jeu d'esprit, full of wit and energy, shape-shifting and wordplay. But behind the playfulness, there's also a sense of questing and questioning, a relentless search for meaning in a world that feels increasingly fractured and refracted. So perhaps a touch of Dalsmerz too. I'll shortly be handing over to Claudine, who will read for about 15 minutes, and then she and I will have a conversation, and then Claudine will read for another 15 minutes, and after that it's a chance for you to put some questions to Claudine through me. So as Jazz says, please put those in the chat. So, without further ado, I will hand over to Two Tongues to Tunji. Thank you to Emma for that very kind introduction, and to, um, to Carcanet for this marvellous series of launches. Uh, they've all been coming thick and fast and I know there's more uh, so I think uh, hats off to them in these tricky times and thank you to you you know you could have picked online poker or uh, pottery or or any number of other options and you pick poetry well done correct choice this is rift pretend it's august Pretend there's sunlight on bare arms, dappled water, louche marauding ducks. 
pretend the sheep wear serious faces, slouch in groins of gouged out rock, and far off, human chatters growing slack, losing all heft until there's nothing on the breeze but buzzards, mewling. Nothing more incomprehensible than that. Nothing more consoling. So that first poem came out of a trip to Cumbria, where um, my mother is from, and I've spent quite a bit of time. In fact, so much time that sheep incessantly creep into my poems. I really can't seem to get rid of them. Sheep and sheep-based activities. So, uh, so there's a smidgen of that in this next one, which is numbers. After your biggest mail out yet to 4,796 of your closest friends and acquaintances, three replied. One said, yes, I can come. Another said, yes, I might come. A third said, no, I can't come. Then it was time for sleep because it was Thursday and for anti-aging purposes, you always tried to be asleep by five. In your dream, there were eight Toyotas, six Kias and a Lamborghini. You totaled all of them in 15 separate crashes. Ended up in hospital where you met a shepherd, a vegan and a gerontologist. The shepherd taught you to count sheep in Cumbrian, Yan, Tian, Tethera, Methera. The vegan was mute and the gerontologist advised you to ditch the number three, the letter C, and all your relations. Well, all of them, you queried, but I have 417 and that's only my nuclear family. In the dream, it came out as enucleate family, which over time got interpreted by five psychiatrists as passive aggression, toxic narcissism, capgrass syndrome, low blood pressure, and angst. You went with angst because you enjoyed saying ich habe angst and because it had the fewest letters and because partially it was true. Capgras syndrome, by the way, is also uh, referred to as imposter syndrome, which is something I haven't uh, been diagnosed with, fortunately, or at least not yet. Hungarians. There are a lot of Hungarians around at the moment. Hungarians in the park, Hungarians in Tesco's. Hodzvoy, they say, Hodzvoy, I say, though it's my only words. That man in the street making a racket, he's Hungarian. And the one who trundles past each day at four with the trolley and the crocodile hat, a hat for hunting crocodiles, I mean, don't be fooled. He's not Australian. He might want to be Australian, but He's Hungarian, all of them are. Even the one called Li Zhong Zhang, and Neil Webb, he's Hungarian, oh, very Hungarian. When you come down to it, every single one of them's Hungarian, even you. Now, I have to make a bit of a disclosure at this juncture, which is that uh, the title of my collection is a lie. There are at least five or six, possibly seven, uh, tongues, not two tongues in the book, but by tongues I of course just mean snippets of uh, other languages and dialects. There's a bit of Welsh, there's a bit of Cumbrian as you've heard, uh, there's some Arabic later, lucky me. Um, and it might just be because I spent a lot of time in my parents' language laboratory. They, they had a business teaching languages, they didn't just randomly have a room in the house for language learning. Um, and uh, it, it, that might be the reason it might not be. Who knows? Who knows? But anyway, before we go any further, I think there is time now for an amendment. We would like to apologise to readers for the mistake in last week's issue and the misspelling of the name Clodine Tatunji. In particular, we would like to make it clear that the person in question's surname is not to be construed as Tutu Gini, Tutalingi, Tutungi, Tutanjaji, Tau Tau Inji, Tutal Inji, Tangerini, Chu Chu Chirini, Tallahassee, Takahashi, Satsiki, Tabugi, Wugi, Turu Turali, 
too Gigi, tootsie, turtle, tut, and furthermore, she's not as foreign as she sounds. Glad to clear that up. I think I should make clear at this juncture that I really, I know you have the words on the screen, uh, but I fully reserve the right to change them at any point. Um, it's just the poet's prerogative. Um, what to say next as a neat segue? Well, uh, I made the most of my surname there and in actual matter of fact, it's the Turkish word for tobacco or tobacconist, I've been told. Hopefully it wasn't a joke because I've been going around saying this for a lot, a lot of time. But anyway, um, it does have some kind of link to tobacco and that may or may not be the reason for all this uh, cigarette smoke in the next poem. Contortionist. In the blackest recesses of Bistro Malatesta, entre les heures du quatre à cinq, foregoing his liaison with Odette for the third time in as many days, Poudam observes a snailfish undulating round the hat stand's spine, the stalagmites of candles. It's sad, small eyes, it's cryptic lack of scales. Wants to cleave to it, wants to shake the dipsomaniac in the corner. His eye, caramba, have you seen it? Here on the Rue Muftar, so far from deep sea canyons, so far from home, considers eating it, flavoured with rosemary, flavoured with dill. Sees it, loses it in Gorwa's furls, catches it again, its curl and curl progression along a velveteen banquette. It stirs him. Its decision in oblivion to be a thing of light and so gelatinous, thinks of turtles nibbled at by surgeon fish, wonders if perhaps he's lost his grip, and if he has, likes it. Uh, now we're moving swiftly from snailfish to donkeys. Um, I recently or relatively recently found out about a marvellous thing in Colombia, which is that there is such a thing as a travelling donkey library. These are donkeys that bring on their backs books to the locals in their area. And so when I, when I heard this, I uh, felt immediately that I had to somehow get it into a poem. Plea. There should be more poems about the Biblioburo of La Gloria. They bray in five or so tongues, cite Stevenson and Spinoza. This pair, known fondly as Beto and Alpha, like Moore's The Cure for Loneliness, is solitude and chunks of apocrypha. He hoard in bursts as the rays batter down, as the rays tend to do in Colombia. Panniers of books banging flanks and the flies. Don't even start on the flies. And there'll be some more flies, uh, possibly flies later. There's definitely a few donkeys later, I believe. This is not my best work. I am endeavoring to write not my best work. The onus how I love the word onus, is all on me. It is a cup I cannot not sup from. It is a hurdle I cannot vault o'er. I should go to a hilltop alone and hunker down in a cave and then come back down and write it. But I am afraid of bats. It is a life goal. It is a long road with very infrequent water holes. I am not man enough. I am insufficiently male, but I can, and I must, begin. The, um, there's a next, uh, the next short little poem, or little short poem, whichever you prefer, um, has a very long title. It's really, really quite a brief poem, you'll be pleased to hear. And it carries on a little bit with this uh, 
sense of gender struggle that crept in at the end of the last poem. Several misogynistic remarks before breakfast, to which I could do wizened and perplexed as good as any maestro. I could do the tetchiness of Chekhov on the afternoon his samovar ran dry, and what irked him most wasn't thirst, but the parching recognition he was widely misunderstood. And that no one, not directors, not his public, not his wife, grasped the full twistiness of his opus. I could, I can, but a woman's brain lacks the plasticity of a man's. I put my head in my hands like Henrik Ibsen at the Grand Café in Edward Monk's Henrik Ibsen at the Grand Café. And um, this will be my last poem for now. Uh, we're moving seamlessly from breakfast to the, to the small hours. Hunter Forager. In the night, I rose up and ate sweet peppers, celery, and a plump, vine-ripe tomato, far more tomato-like than its insipid sibling consumed earlier that day. I was distracted by another resignation, one more in a line of abdications at a time when clear thinking, strategic deals, impossible to brook further delay, I drifted. And my nose, I admit, was out of joint something infernal and malign in an email from before, condescension masquerading as tact. And a panel had come down in the yard and there were things in the bed, magnifiers, microphones. Strictly speaking, nothing was as it should be. Dictation in my ear from an unknown source running through a comprehensive list of my infractions, along with additional reflections on the imminent collapse of all things versus the elasticity of the soul. Hard to tell at 3.12 if the soul would win. At 3.14, I rose again and swept my floor like an old time Paleolithic wife. I was content and no birds sang, except one bird whose call was a regular truffly snore, which gave me comfort until I joined him. Thank you, Claudine. I was worried for a moment earlier that I was going to have to play you for the entire evening and I wasn't sure I was up to it. So I'm very... <laughs> Thank you. There's a brilliant menagerie of poems there. Um, I wanted to start by asking you really about that last poem, Hunter Forager, because um, my sense of that poem is that it's partly about the distractibility of modern life, you know, the Twitter feed, the noise, the 24 hour news program with the ticker tape scrolling along the bottom. And I'm interested that your response to that is not to go up to a hilltop cave full of bats um, and hunker down, but instead to, to incorporate that distractedness into the poem itself. And does that come out of an impulse to attempt to capture modern life or is it about the juxtapositions that that creates? Um, good, very good question. I mean, I wish I knew. I, I think I need a disclaimer at the beginning of this, which is to say that, you know, like a lot of poets, I don't have any clue really what I'm doing until, well, never, basically. Um, you're kind of following, following a, an improvisatory uh, hunch. But that said, I don't rule out distraction, because if I did, I would never write anything in, in the sense that being distracted is sort of you know, the headset of our times. Um, and so I think it, it's quite freeing when you make that realization that, that a poem is a very uh, generously shaped entity. It, it can take it, you know, it can take um, you putting in a, a list of names called out in a waiting room or, you know, news headlines or business jargon or information speak. I mean, I didn't always think like that. I think I, I um, probably, went through some kind of pain barrier before which I was quite stuck thinking, well, I'm not sure I'm writing the right kind of poems or what are the rules of this poem business? 
And then when I realized that really uh, there are no rules and that's the joy of it, it was very freeing. So what is it that gets a poem going for you? Is it, is it finding the first line and then following the momentum of that? Um, I never know what, what line it will be, as in, in what position it will, it will turn up in the poem. But yeah, probably. I mean, I definitely am a lover of language and of voice. And I think I store things up a bit like a pathological magpie. Um, it's quite obsessive and deranged. Uh, I mean, I don't actually make lists. Um, per se, or at least very chaotically I do. But I think, yeah, you, you're kind of keeping your ear out um, often, and then certain things will will resonate more than others. And you'll, you'll get to a point where you'll think, well, I have to try and set it free in a poem and see where it goes. Um, at least for me, I think that's what I do. <laughs> and humour is clearly a very important thread through, through your work. Um, I wonder if we're not sometimes a bit snooty about humour and lightheartedness, perhaps particularly in British poetry, I don't know. Um, but, I, but I wondered, Calvino has a, a line about the lightness of thoughtfulness. And yeah. I wondered to what extent that lightness and lightheartedness in your poems is a, is a kind of counter to the, the weight of the world. Well, I hope so, and it would be lovely if that's the case. I, I don't really know, again, I'm sort of saying the same thing. I, I think if you try to be funny, you, you en end up not being, that's just the way of things. And I, I tend to find that the ones I think are gonna be hilarious get you know very little response. And then I'll write something which I think is incredibly serious and poignant and moving and everyone's laughing. So I don't know what that means. Um, but yes, I mean, I can't deny it. You know, I grew up sort of really enjoying and loving the great supreme raconteurs and, and, and comedians, you know, the Ustinovs and Victor Borgia and those kinds of folk and their sort of exquisite timing and ability to, to just do anything, do anything with their voice and, and make it finesse it, you know, make it funny or make it fit well in their act may have been something that I was secretly hankering after all along. In vaudeville. Vaudeville, exactly. I think I'm a vaudevillian monkey to an extent. But I mean, again, I, I feel like that, you know, it's, it sounds so premeditated when you have these conversations, which, you know, and thank you for these, these questions because they, they're really helpful to me as well. When, when you look back, because most of the time, you know, if you do get to the end of a, of a poem, well, first of all, you never know if you've got to the end, but if you think you might have something reasonably fit for purpose, um, you've totally forgotten really <laughs> how you got there. It's, it's strange, mysterious. I want, to, I want to talk to you about performance because you trained as an actor and uh, it's easy to imagine how that background influences your dramatic writing. But what role does it play, if you'll forgive the extended metaphor, um, what role does it play in your poetic writing? Well, I don't see there as being a huge gap between poetry and drama. I mean, I think it's all dramatic writing and the best poems I hope are like many dramatic experiences. Either there's some conflict or tension that builds to a point of surprise, you know, th those kinds of things, those mechanics um, hopefully are in there. But I guess I do like speakers, I do like character, um, and I, but before all of that, I like voice. We were talking about this and, and it struck me that, you know, when you're writing a play, you do have to be quite concerned, or at least at a certain point with the logistics, you know, the bodies on the stage moving around. Whereas the quite exciting thing with a poem is these are disembodied voices and they're floating free. And so that's, that's uh, quite, that has a lot of potential for, for, for lunacy, which I, which I like. Yeah, you don't have to worry about backstory or, or plausibility, actually. No, certainly none of these are very plausible, I would say. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you also play a lot with um, cliché and jargon and direct quotations. And I wonder what the appeal of those, those sort of stock formulations are to you. 
well i think you know i mean again it's that thing of if something is hanging around in the air a lot like some kind of overused bit of language um maybe i'm just a natural born ecologist i want to kind of dust it down and recycle it you know it, it, or at least you know it, it, it's something that is carrying some kind of weight you know the brexit language in hunter forager just now which is sort of clear thinking strategic deals you you kind of think well that's we're hearing these phrases again and again what happens if i take them out of context and set them off in a poem you know sometimes it might be to ironic effect and sometimes it might be quite absurd and sometimes it might fall flat but um again it i think you kind of you kind of do it because you can't not do it you've got you've got to a point where certain things have 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 gained a certain freight or momentum in your mind and you have to use them <laughs> in some way i suppose they are, they are often metaphorically rich in themselves it's just they, they've lost the power of the metaphor often so i guess is it a case of re-sparking recharging those metaphors maybe i mean i i you know i took a, a washing a washing label in smoothie and it ended up being a, a, a sort of song of marital discord um it's that thing of taking a line for a walk you know which isn't me obviously i checked that before that's paul clay um and he was he was painting or sorry drawing drawing but you know it's the same thing of of just letting yourself go with something that for some reason has got your goat or has uh you've become charged in some way i suppose there's also they're also the kind of phrases and formulas that people hide behind when they're not feeling confident and that's another theme i find in your poetry is the sense of people who aren't quite sure of who they are or, or their identities are being imposed on them from outside yeah, I mean, I, that probably does also link up with my interest in and passion for theatre because, you know, disguise and and, um, you know, masks, all of that side of things have always fascinated me and who we are, you know, who we are behind those things. But then, of course, you take away the mask and there's just another mask. So you can actually do that in a poem. You can layer you can layer language on register and and. Uh, see what comes out that, that may or may not have some some resonance for for the reader or the listener thank you well i think we should hear some more poems so i will oh, yes shut okay. myself now <laughs> i'm just excited emma that my camera didn't actually break during that uh, q a so i'm still here i think I, I look like i'm still here at least uh, according to my camera hopefully for you out there as well uh, so these next couple of poems are, in fact, uh, insp were inspired by a visit to to France, to the Alps, and so there's a bit of fresh air in, in the mix, but also a certain degree of oddness. I mean, being surrounded by the Alps was lovely and sinister, and when I got back, I was vaguely hallucinating Mont Blanc in Luton Airport car park. Uh, the only other thing to say is that this first line in this new poem is the French for I like your hedgehog. The marmots are suffocating. J'admire votre hérisson, you tell the woman in the artisanal cake shop, because it isn't every day you see a chocolate sculpted hedgehog. And in the forest glade, upon discovering that all wild bees are welcome at the bee hotel. You ask the hive, and what about les abeilles domestiques? The hive makes no reply. Likewise, the mountains textbook blanket silence, and you below overcompensating, filling the void with topic after random chit chat topic. Le kilomètre vertical, the recipe for tartiflette the conjunction of the Sirocco and fern that blew a little bird straight through the restaurant. The cat, macaroon, perdu ou volé. And the writing on the wall in the tunnel under the bridge. Ici, les marmottes suffoquent. Tartiflette, by the way, in case you didn't know, contains lardons, potatoes, cheese, many, many delicious ingredients that are all uh, to be looked up afterwards 
and it's very fortifying I imagine probably just what you need if you've been up and down Mont Blanc or doing whatever you do uh, in the valley what do they do in the valley there let's find out glacial erratics we drank unpasteurized milk in the valley we imbibed the non-compliant polyamorous air in the valley we got in touch with our authentic rage in the valley we made inroads into inroads in the valley we took the tops of our heads off in the valley we held as twere a mirror up to nature in the valley we ate the flesh of the valley we bathed in glacial flower in the valley we got a sort of stupid crush on the valley we objectified the valley we to some extent coerced the valley and to a lesser extent empowered the valley we bought shares in the valley we lost everything at the casino in the valley we exhausted the valley we denuded the valley we discussed whether it was hegemony or hegemony in the valley we put ourselves through eccentric contractions in the valley we died intestate in the valley we came back to life in the valley we expected a hell of a lot from the valley we forgot the names of what we were looking at in the valley we wore approach shoes in the valley we diagnosed a handful of complaints in the valley we had a case of the vapors in the valley we melted thawed and resolved into a dew in the valley we were entirely transparent in the valley we added our innate natural charm to the innate natural charm of the valley so that's that massive relief uh, over here to have got to the end of that one uh, I think after all that, it's just time for a short disclaimer. Lapsang Souchong is the colour picked for our apartment walls, and the internet does not tempt me. Landslide in Southeast Province kills teen backpackers, and the internet does not tempt me. Have a soggy sense of politics, intend to oven crisp it, and the internet does not tempt me. Likes Witzler's keeps coon hounds, stir fries tufted vetch, and the internet does not tempt me. The old kinds of boiler wear out. Smart ones wear fume hoods, quetch in forums about storm damage, how I suffered rust, how I got over it, how I knew it was an act of God, and the internet on no account tempts me. I wish that were true of me. Unfortunately, it's not. It's true of Hilary Mantel, of whom it's a quote. Um, apart from internet mania, there is not that much AI or smart tech in two tongues. Save for a smidgen, which will crop up in this next poem. The age of invention. All this kowtowing to nature gets right up my antihistamine addicted nose. Some days for lunch I have cheese, on cheese with additional cheese on top. It's all I can do to shave and sit around clean shaven like a bad backfired joke with no pun line, I mean punchline, whatever, who cares, it was never going to work. I knew it the minute I read the cheese label up close and saw it wasn't cheese, it was some shit called aioli dip. Who needs that? Not me, not anyone. I call my mum and say, mum, they have a machine now, a robot that can do the lawn. Yes, she says, I know, I am the robot. It's actually called a mobot, I discovered after I had written the poem, which was really a disappointment. I wish I'd got that in. Zugzwang. I am unhappy about your description of my life as dull. It is dull, but I dislike you using the word dull. If I could, I would unhook the receiver from the wall and place it on your dirty mouth. 
I don't feel able to elucidate. If you hadn't known the German for Lose Lose, if you hadn't the face of Dura as Christ in self-portrait of Dura as Christ, things could have been a whole lot easier. As it is, the slum donkeys of Marrakesh surround me. They bray with hindsight, their arpeggios are pertinent. This is not a metaphor. This is the blue phase, which stems from the beige phase, which stems from taking too much of a run up, too much virtue signaling and fog, heavy duty fog. And if as forecasts indicate, there is to be more fog, Lord grant me the strength to be dinky and circumspect. I told you there'd be more donkeys. I never lie, or at least not that much. Now then, just a few more, um, and then I am out of your hair. Ah oh, yes. By small signs we betray ourselves. People know when you are not quite right. Even if you're merely one who'd like to wear a fez and stroll about requesting Munkin te kalim shui shui. Because you like your fez, you had it from your grandfather, and because you'd like them to talk slowly, please. You've sunk 400 on beginner's Arabic, people know. Even the light caught between the blinds casts a jaundiced eye on your aspersions. What you want is not what you think you want. You think you want tousled hair and kissed shoulders. You think you want beetroot and ham hock and to rub your head against his shin like a cat, but what it amounts to is people know. They know you put your faith in soda powder swallowed by the vat to neutralize your internal acidity. Muffled as you are with sluicing, mossy as you are with mottled teeth, miniature as you are, you can't keep hiding. The amygdala knows its own agenda. The hippocampus lately likes to grass. I kept rehearsing that in the voice of Colin Firth in The English Patient, which I don't know why that happened. I shouldn't really be admitting it on air. This next poem, and it's the penultimate poem, is um, <clears throat> one that came out of a visit to a basement clinic in Moorfields Eye Hospital. And at the time they were very crowded, these clinics. They've had to thin things out now for obvious reasons. And uh, all the names in it are true. chronic waiting zone. These are the daylight hours, but we absorb beneath the surface, tepid lighting. Shrink, feet please, for a husband wheeling woman. Fixate on trolleyed notes and staff who pass and pass. Does anyone believe in all this striding? Or the litany of strange stranger names? Shahido Hulk? Dawn Carrier, Angela Chart, something is up. Something is very definitely crawly and dark on the outskirts of our vision. A girl tells Hazel in reception, they were 9.15 and now it's 12.08. Gets back, we go by numbers here, not times, and X and V and Y start crawling. And if it's just a black dot on the horizon, why is it following us? What do we do if it ripens? It's hot, not letting up. We could strip. Quiet today, says Hazel. I like it. <clears throat> and Hazel did actually say that. She was enjoying her job. So thank you so much again for listening. This last one for now, almost forever, or at least this evening. <clears throat> comes from the fact that near where I live here in Cambridge, there are cows that roam free on the common land, um, which is good for me because it makes a change from sheep. Lammas land. The cows were in the margins today, 
I was treading through piles of their elegant powder dry rejections. They were keeping nice and cool in the shade while I was kicking up spray storms of fallout. A throaty warbler, a percussive cheep, something sonic in the hedgerow, that was the gist of it. You could call this an attempt at prayer, an attempt to call upon my higher power, but someone somewhere would no doubt get all up in my face about it, get all exercised at my choice of doxology. Oh, cows, how do you do this thing you do, this lingering on the edges, this solid disregard for anything but grass and air, sometimes flies, this absence? I have seen you running through a field fleet like horses, but that was years ago. Clearly you don't make it a habit. Cows, I bow to you. I will bow my head and learn. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Lady. That was brilliant. You're welcome. I'm, I'm a little bit disappointed not to hear your Colin Firth impression, but <laughs> should give us <laughs> Um, I have got a few questions from the audience, and if anybody else wants, wants to ask questions, please add them to the Q&A or to the chat, and I'll try and get through some of them. Um, I have one more question of my own in response to that last poem, which is uh, about sound. I suppose I asked this being a radio producer myself, and because you were also a radio producer. And I wonder, uh, I suppose I'm biased even asking this, but whether that training and that background makes you experience and hear the world in a different way. I was just thinking about the um, what, the percussive. Oh, right. The percussive keep something <coughs> sonic in the hedgerow. Percussive keep, yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I think I'm quite sensitive to sound. I mean, I, 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 I don't say that like, you know, it's like I'm special or something, but I definitely, it's not always a good thing. I, 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 cause I get impatient if I don't like the sound, the sounds around me. Uh, but I, I, yeah, you must find this. I mean, you, you tell me, and I, I would say that, that it must be the case. You spend so long, hours and hours of your life, your working life, listening to sound, and you've, you've been um, doing that for more years than me. <laughs> but you do. Sorry, that sounds really rude. But you know what I mean. You get very attuned to sound. You do, and I think um, you can't turn it off sometimes. But. Uh, so yes, I suppose, I, I don't know if I hear it differently though, who knows what anyone's hearing at any one time, but I think I am quite attuned to sound, yes, for sure. A few questions from the audience. I'm sorry, I don't have a name for this one, but um, somebody's asked about um, your experience of restless nights that you often seem to write about restless nights. <laughs> and I wonder if you, do you wake in the middle of the night and find yourself writing a poem? No. I'm far too lazy. No, I don't write a poem in the night, but I, I do sometimes have a voice recorder um, if I'm organized, which is rarely. Uh, and, 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 and if, which is also rarely, it's really a, something that I feel I, I have to capture. I will record it into my voice recorder. Um, uh, but um, I, I mean, restless nights, I, I don't know. I, I, I try to make my peace with the fact that I often have a patch of being awake in the night, which maybe quite a lot of people do. I don't know, but I've just, and now it's quite a creative moment, so I quite like it. <laughs> uh, I have a question from Adam, which is about your last lines, because your last lines tend to raise the stakes and set out towards far horizons rather than tidily seal the poems off. Do you know that these endings are coming, or is it in the process of writing the poems that you think yes? Um, well, endings are hard, aren't they? I mean, you know, from your own writing, uh, I'm sure that in uh, um, you just want you just want it to end sometimes. So, <laughs> I, and I think possibly maybe it's common for a lot of poets who you might have a really good line, and therefore you think, oh, I'll have to make that the last line because because you, you you want the you beginning and the end you want to be strong. You can maybe get away with the middle being ropey. Um, <laughs> But um, so I do move lines around and sometimes I, when I'm redrafting, I will, uh, you know, rearrange the order. 
And then sometimes if I'm workshopping, and Adam will know this, uh, some kind person will point out that the best line is four lines from the end, and then you just cut the rest. Um, Peter asks, um, and all writers hate this question because your mind goes blank. So if, if it does, we all forgive you. Um, who's your, do you have a main influence or influences? Oh, right. Oh, uh, do you mean for poetry? Oh, uh, no. <laughs> I don't have a, a main one, but I do, I do, you know, there's, there's people that I return to a lot, like, but it, it varies loads. I mean, at the moment, I could tell you that Mary Ruffle, um, who, again, I might be pronouncing her surname wrong, which I hope I'm not, um, I absolutely love at the moment. And so I'm finding so much in her work because I, and, and I don't know it that, and there's a lot of it. Um, and Paul Durkin just is a name that floats into my mind as someone I, when I'm feeling a bit stuck, he's, it's, the writing is so open and flowing and, and hilarious and humane that, and, and Matthew uh, Sweeney as well, you know, you, you feel, um, but, but I, you can't pin it down because it, there's too much good stuff out there and it feels wrong to try and just say, oh, I've only got these four people because there's more. I suppose going back to what we were talking about earlier, do you think there is a slight wariness about humour in British poetry? I mean, there shouldn't be. We've got a long tradition of uh, yeah in verse. I mean, if you think of Chaucer and Pope and Swift. Yes, and... yeah. I I don't know. I think possibly. I mean, I, I haven't said that. I can think of some funny poets I've seen reading quite recently. Um, Luke Samuel Le Yates and, and Lorraine Mariner um, that just come to mind. But having said that, largely speaking, I think that it's, uh, I don't know if everyone, everyone has different senses of humor and therefore they're, they're a bit afraid that if you strike the wrong note, it will, especially in this day and age where obviously sensibilities are, are quite easily ruffled. You know, I think there might be some reticence. Whereas in America, generally where the field is so vast and the horizons are wide and and there's there's all sorts going on you know maybe they're and maybe they have their history of of vaudeville and and showbiz that the, the yeah that people like um billy collins and Kay ryan are are very much lauded aren't they for what they do and rightly so uh, anthony asks what does claudine regard as the role of emotion in her poetry well, it should behave itself. <laughs> it should stiff up a lip <laughs> at all times. Um, I mean, I don't interrogate it too kind of in too much of a cerebral way. I'm trying as I go along to get more of a sense of where the kind of you know to kind of stress test a poem. So that because you don't want to you know you you want a poem to feel that it's doing something. Wait, you know, I say weighty, having just talked about levity, but I mean, you don't want to th throw away the heart of a poem. So I think, yeah, I, 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 um, I mean, I do a lot of, I've mentioned this uh, before uh, recently, that I, I do a lot of automatic writing. And the good thing about that is you're not sort of uh, overanalyzing yourself in the way you might do in, 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 a, in a room with a therapist, but there, there will be things that come up from writing almost uh, high speed automatically and that that you then have to in a calmer moment of reflection i try to locate some of the um the meat i suppose that relates to a question from joanna who says um you spoke of getting through the pain barrier and getting to a freer place in terms of what you felt able to put into poems how did you break through this is that through the automatic writing um partly and just like plodding on and i think oh we might have had a conversation ourselves because uh you know you, with your own possible inspiration there that that is just that sense of I, d I don't know where i hit upon this 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 feeling that you just have to put it all in there's no point sort of censoring yourself or um kind of looking at it from a very analytical distanced way um maybe it's desperation emma who knows <laughs> <laughs> joe if it's joe joe who i think it is just just 
<laughs> get to a stage of desperation and, and write from that. <laughs> Well, Michael's asked a question about um, being free to change the words, um, <laughs> and, and I suppose that's between the the page poem and the the red poem. Um, yes. Is that it? Yes. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm just trying to get to the question. It, um, I, I suppose it's a question about the different valencies of the the, the poem out loud and the poem on the page and uh, your awareness of the difference between the two. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I was, um, I mean, in an ideal world, I wouldn't change the words. <laughs> um, uh, you know, I, I, I decided to free myself up by saying that earlier because I have to recite for, for eyesight reasons and I enjoy reciting. It's, this is not a complaint or a poor me. Um, and as I, as I do it more, and I have been doing it in times of COVID quite often on Zoom, um, I realise it is much more akin to song. I mean, I'm not a, I'm not a singer. I don't perform in that way. But obviously, the rhythm carries you through. Uh, if you're going solo, going from without the page in front of you and, and doing it by heart, and I think I just need to feel that that I can prioritise the rhythm, even if a little word change or an ordering change occurs. Um, I, I, I want the poem, <laughs> I would much prefer the poem to come out exactly as it is on, on the page in Two Tongues, the book. Um, and mostly I think they did. <laughs> but I think, um, I think yeah, it's, it's no bad thing in, in the immediacy of wanting your, your listener to come with you um, and have an oral experience, a bit like song. If the odd shift occurs, that's fine, as long as you stick to your guns and keep your rhythm going. And I have one last question, which is from Emily. Uh, what role do animals play in your poems? Uh, she particularly loves the loose marauding ducks, as do I. Thank you, thank you, Emily, for that question. Every role I can give them, it would appear. Um, I'm glad you. I'm glad that the loose marauding ducks have had a little bravo because I I did a, a reading not long ago and. I specifically got asked, "What do you mean? <laughs> what do you mean these ducks were loose?" Uh, it, was, it was a women's institute uh, group and they, they took exception, um, so I backed off. But they are loose around here, although those were Cumbrian ducks. Um, yeah, I don't, I, I think they just do creep in because they're there and we are creatures and we're creaturely and... I mean, I did talk earlier about the poem being a site for disembodied voices, but on the kind of total flip side of that is the fact that it, it's also highly physical experience and a sensory and a sensuous experience so you can't get away from nature in all its 3d glory brilliant thank you thank you claudine that was a terrific reading and uh, terrific to hear you talking about your poems so applause from all of us single person applause representing 70 of us um so <laughs> Please would you play us out with the final poem? Thank you. Thank, thank you to, to everyone. And, and um, yeah, this final poem is The Architecture of Sky. The architecture of sky doesn't tremble at solitude, isn't dwarfed by loss. The architecture of sky isn't porticos and palisades pavement and brick. The architecture of sky is the song of a robin whose cubist grammar is holding us up. Thank you. Um, thank you so much Claudine and thank you Emma. Um, this has been really 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 intriguing and um wonderful to hear you read read those poems um yeah such a great performer um, and this has been great thank you guys all for being here um we really appreciate your support um and thank you for paying um to join this reading i'm just gonna pop the link for you to buy the book into the chat um check your emails if you want to do that tomorrow and get in touch with me if you have any problems um i can help you out with anything like that um, so the last thing that remains for me to say is please join us 
At the same time next week, we're going to be launching John Burt Whistle's new book um, in the event. Um, he will be talking with Hugh Horton about that new tech. So um, check the website, sign up for our newsletter, follow us on social media, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, but thank you for being here, and congratulations to Claudine. Um, this was really wonderful. Um, I'm going to go now, but I'm going to leave this open for a couple of minutes so you can put your last minute messages in the chat. Um, it's been really great to share this with you guys. So thank you very much, and good night.